Psalm 32, verse 1, a psalm of King David. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Underline it. Underline it. Exacto it, knife out of your Bible when you get home. Eat it. Put it in your mouth. Let it dissolve on your tongue. Make it part of your DNA. This verse is so important because this is truly the way to live your life. You will not be able to keep yourself from sinning because you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're in rebellion. Our hearts seek after things that are not godly. But God does not leave us to our own devices. God does not leave us in our own mess. David says, blessed is the one whose transgression is what? It's forgiven. It's covered. That God covers your sin. God forgives your sin. Blessed, Blessed are you if God has forgiven your sin. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Verse 2, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whom and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, verse 6, therefore, because of that, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, it will not reach him, for you are a hiding place for me, God. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like the horse or the mule or a teenager without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and the bridle or else it will not stay by you. Verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Coming clean. Coming clean. Actually, before we even start, we need to get something out of the way, something very godly. Ladies and gentlemen, This is No Shave November. So men, if you won't lose your job or your marriage, it is time for you to step up. Unless you're one of those guys that can only grow patches, then just call it quits and just shave it. Okay, sorry. This is No Shave November. Some of you men need to step up to the game. Make it happen, Captain. Ladies, you are not invited to this party. This is not a party you're invited to. Should you choose to uh, be a part of this party uh, of No Shave November, I do not want to see it. So, (laughs) but guys, this is your invitation to join the party. So, coming clean, number one. We are built for a pure heart. We are built for a pure heart. Humanity is designed by God to have a relationship with him. God's original intent was that people coexist with him in an authentic, unhindered state that promoted open, honest, and pure, heartfelt interaction. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've looked at Genesis chapter 2, which is basically the story of God building our first parents. He builds Adam, he builds Eve, and from their union, we are here. We are humanity traced back to our first parents. In that first parental creation of God, he has pure interactions with his creation. Imagine God speaking to people in a real, physical, connective way. That's how you and I are designed to interact with God. Imagine this morning if uh, you didn't have to listen to me. If God himself could descend upon this stage and speak to you, wouldn't that be awesome? Hey. 
careful. I had a girl in the first service go, yeah, that'd be great. And we kicked them out. So <laughs> that would be amazing. If we had God who himself physically could descend here and speak to us, that is the ideal of our lives. Because watch this, that's how you're built. You are built to have a relationship with God. Because of sin, our physical connection with God can no longer be. After Adam and Eve sinned, humanity now has not dealt with God physically, but we have dealt with God spiritually. So watch, our hearts are still built for that first pure, unhindered interaction with God. We are built for that. Our hearts desire it. We are built for a purity of heart. Many of us, it's been so many years since we've had a pure heart, we can't even remember what that's like. Our hearts are so corroded and weighed down with just years of living and poor choices that we have not dealt with that we just feel like our hearts are an anchor. That we don't feel purity, we don't feel lightness, we don't feel forgiveness, we feel nothing but heavy. But watch this. Your heart is built for a pure interaction with God. It's not a mistake. You're built for God. But all of our sin has weighed us down. We are built for a pure heart. Even after sin entered the world, damaging humanity's unobstructed connection to God, people still long for a real heartfelt attachment to him. Without God's intervention, people are unable to have a pure heart, though we long for it, even if we have never experienced it ourselves. And so you see this sometimes, you know, atheists, I have run into people that, that follow atheism or, uh, you know, I don't believe it's a God, it's all a fairy tale, you need a crutch to get through life, uh, you know, because you're weak or, you know, I don't need that kind of thing in my life. You know, if you need to believe in a spaghetti monster to come create the universe, okay, good for you, but I'm intelligent and you're just kind of dumb. You need to gimp through your life with a little crutch. Okay, but that's not me. But you know what the funny part is? You can't get away from yourself. And your heart, when it's unforgiven, is so weighed down inside, it testifies against you that there is a God. It testifies, your own heart tells you things aren't okay, things are not right. My heart is torn to shreds. I have no way of getting rid of this heft in my heart spiritually. And your heart tells you that you're built for God. You're built for a clean heart. Even if you don't have one, even if you've never experienced it, you're built for a clean heart. The problem is that so many of us have lived years without coming clean that we don't even remember what that's like. It's like if you were born with a, with a kind of a malformed hip and all through your life, from the time you were a little child, couldn't play sports, you couldn't do anything physical, you had to go through your life because your hip was not formed correctly. Or if you were a child and you, had, you were born with some sort of cancer and throughout your childhood, your teens, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, you've always gone to the doctor and had blood transfusions or some kind of dealing with your cancer. It's like, you don't even remember a time when you didn't have that, right? You don't even remember a time. You're like, my whole life I've, I've, I've walked this way. My whole life I've dealt with this cancer in my life. My whole life. I don't even remember what it's like to, to be a healthy person. And that's the same way it is for some of us in our lives. We've accumulated our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, our 50s. Have just, it's been a weight of bad choices that we haven't dealt with. And we look back on our lives and go, why the heck am I even still alive? I'm just grinding through my days. But the beauty is that not only are you built for a pure heart, but God can give you one again. It is this restless desire of our hearts that exposes the original relationship with God that he intended. Happiness comes from the heart, and there is no true happiness without purity of heart. You can look for happiness in another relationship. You can look for happiness in a bottle. You can look for happiness in a hit of meth. You can look for happiness in something on the computer. You can look for happiness, but that happiness is so short-lived. It's just like bang, and it's over, and all of a sudden you've compiled more guilt on top of the guilt you already had. And it's like this expanding balloon of 
impurity. And it leads to despair. Because you're like, I can't offload this. Number one, we are built for a pure heart. I want you to understand that. You're built for it. It's inside your heart already. Even as I speak, you're understanding what I'm saying because that's how you're designed. Number two, we are sabotaged by a guilty heart. We are sabotaged by a guilty heart. If you've ever been in the military, we have a, a, an awesome military ministry here and uh, just fantastic men and women that serve our country. If you've ever been on the field, if you've ever been on a mission, if you've ever been overseas and you have a, a direction that you're supposed to go with your men or women into combat and it's a secret and you're all huddled up ready to go on whatever you've been asked to do and one person has told where you are because they're a traitor and everybody dies because someone sabotaged that mission. It's the same thing with our hearts. We desire purity of heart. We desire to be forgiven. But over the years, we have compiled so much that we go, purity of heart must be impossible even though I know I desire it. And our own heart sabotages the purity we want. It's something we know we desire, but our own heart sabotages that. It's like if I, if I really love candles, I look at that candle, I'm like, oh, that's a sweet candle. Now, it only costs 48 cents at Walmart or whatever. But because I'm a lover of candles, I say, you know, Walmart's a big company. Mr. Wall... Mart won't even miss this candle. Oh, hey, what's going on? Oh, whoops. Hey. Pass by the Walmart greeter. What's up? I don't need a sticker today. I'm cool. And I get home, I got this candle. This candle's awesome. Hmm. But you know, then I realize. I got a candle, but now I'm a thief. And any enjoyment I would ever get out of that candle is actually overtaken by the guilt I feel that, I have, that I'm a thief. For a 58 cent candle now, I've compiled guilt in my heart. So the purity that my heart wants, it actually sabotages that by desiring something illicit and when I go after that thinking this will make me happy all of a sudden the thing that I thought was going to make me happy has actually sabotaged the purity of heart and it's compiled the guilt that I want to actually get rid of when believers sin they not only affect their relationship with God but others and themselves as well it is this transgression. So look at uh, Psalm 32, 1. Blessed is the man who's what? Transgression. Okay, so most of your translations probably say transgression or sin or whatever. I want you to circle that word and put a little, um, write a little thing next to it. The word is, the Hebrew word there is pisha, and it means rebellion or revolt. It says, blessed is the man or woman whose revolt or rebellion against God has been forgiven. Imagine when your kids rebel against you, when you say, I want you to be home at 10, and they text you at like 11.012, <laughs> and you go, I thought you were supposed to be home at 10, now it's 11.012, and you're texting me. Oh, I just, you know, me and Johnny were him, blah, 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 whatever the excuse is, and you're like, I told you to be home at 10. All caps. I'm an adult now. You're 14, get your butt home. Whoa, that hit home. 
It says, blessed is the man. And the Hebrew idea of blessed or the Jewish idea of blessed literally means lighthearted or happy. It means like blessed is the man or woman whose transgression, whose rebellion against God, the things that we've done against God, even if we've sinned against people, we sin against God first because it's his standard that we have broken. Blessed is the man or woman whose sin, whose rebellion, whose transgression is forgiven. Why? Because now you can actually have a chance at being happy. Now you can actually have a chance at a clean, pure heart because God has forgiven your sin. Without that, you have no possibility of being blessed. You're just gonna grind through your life. I'm just telling you. As your pastor, I'm just telling you. Blessed is the man or woman who has repented of their sin and just came to God and go, I'm screwed up, I'm jacked up, help me. I've sinned against you, my rebellion, my revolt against you is over. All of a sudden, God just releases that guilt from your heart. It is this transgression of God's ideal that brings accompanying guilt into the heart. Like a cancer, unconfessed sin produces guilt that destroys our confidence in our relationship with God and others. And I love Ephesians 4, 29 through 30. Um, and it's up on the screen up here. The very first part of that verse is, do not what? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When I think about God, I go, here's a God is everlasting, eternal. He doesn't have to eat. He doesn't need people. He needs nothing. He exists on his own accord. He has all the power in the universe. He has patience. He has love. He looks at humans who he has made that I'll only survive, if I'm lucky, 70, 80 years. And I would think that God, because he's eternal and he's not stressed out, he doesn't worry about what things are going to happen. He already has it all set up that he would look at my life and go, oh, I can, I can hang with you for 80 years. But actually, when I'm in rebellion against God, when I commit pisha, when I, when I commit revolt against God, the Holy Spirit of God is actually grieved. You actually grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It's like when your kids keep rebelling against you and you're like, stop, stop, stop. Do you love me, Dad? Yes, but stop. It's like after a while, when you're a parent, you tell your kids in a, in a quiet, calm voice, please stop that, sweetie. That'd be great. You know what? If you just cease doing that right now, it would be awesome. I would love that. As a parent that loves you, I love you, but you need to stop. And they keep doing it. <clears throat> it would be great if you'd, if you'd quit, like right now. That'd be great. I know, I'd, no, I mean like right now. <laughs> keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. <clears throat> Baby, I need you to stop that right now. I mean right now. I don't mean later. I don't mean in a little bit. I don't mean like, ah, oh, I mean now. And then after a while, it escalates. It's gone from, if you would have just stopped five transactions ago, it'd be over. No yelling, no screaming, no plates like Frisbees across the room. Nothing would have happened. But it goes ding, 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 pretty soon. Because you think your child has lost their hearing, you have to go to another level. <laughs> That's the same thing with God in our lives. When we continually commit unconfessed rebellion, God goes stop, 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 stop. And after a while, the Holy Spirit is actually grieved. Actually, it's like disappointment. It's like, come on. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Look at verse 31. So, how do, we, how do we ungrieve the Holy Spirit of God? Let all bitterness, things that you've held on to for years that have caused like the cancer inside of your heart, let all bitterness and wrath, meaning like if you get angry easy, the minute something doesn't go right at work or doesn't go right at home, it's like, oh, God, what happened? The, the dog barked. <laughs> Dude, you just went nuts. What is going on? <laughs> like if you just feel, if you're just right, anger's just sitting right below, it's like this thing. It looks like it's wood, but it's actually veneer, right? The top of this is like wood veneer. You look at this and go, oh, look at that nice piece of oak. Nope, 
It's not, it's plywood with a little bit of veneer on top. If, you, if you're one of those people that lives with anger, right, there's just a veneer covering your anger, like, oh, I'm a real peaceful person, until something happens, you go, you just go nuts. That's the idea of wrath. You're always ready to fight. You're MMA ready. <laughs> Nobody better look at me, brother. Oh, but what? That's wrath. No fuse, no nothing, always ready to fight because your heart is not right before God, okay? Bitterness, wrath, anger, the, the, the outworking of wrath, you're just continually ready to, 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 to express the way you feel inside. Rather than having self-control, you feel no self-control. Anger and clamor basically means chaos, you create chaos and slander. So you stab people in the back because you're insecure or whatever. You can't let other people's lives be good because you feel bad about yourself, so they have to feel bad. That's what slander is. Be put where? Put away from you. But you're like, I can't get rid of it. I can't drink it away. I can't meth it away. I can't other illicit relationship it away. I can't get rid of it. So what are you saying? How can I put it away from you? Or how can I put it away from my heart? How can I have a clean heart again? I can't. Right, you can't without God. Blessed is the man whose transgression is what? Forgiven. Forgiven. God says, you've committed sin against me. You will be happy when you and I have a right relationship again. But until this happens, you will not. You will not be blessed. You will not feel heart, a heart that's light. You will have all of that. Bitterness, wrath, anger, chaos, and slander. That'll be part of your life. So you put it away from you by repenting, by coming to me and finding forgiveness from God. God says, come to me, all ye the world, the whole earth, and find forgiveness. Oh, I totally messed up this paper. Oh, here we go. I got another service. Sorry about that paper. <laughs> Prolonged spiritual guilt can lead to broken relationships, broken spirits, broken lives, and broken bodies. It's amazing how unconfessed sin will actually affect your physical look. You always have anxiety, you always feel bad, you don't sleep well, you don't eat well, your stomach is always turning, you feel exhausted because your heart is not right. After a while, people's bodies break down. You know what, what David said right there in, the, in verse three, for when I kept silent, Psalm 32, three, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. I knew I had to repent, but I didn't. It's like when you feel you have to vomit when you got the flu, and you're like, I'm not gonna throw up. It's going, I need to get out, I need to get out, I need to get out, and you're like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Ah. It's one of the things I hate is throwing up. I'd rather be sick than throw up. But my stomach's like, uh-uh. Now we're getting rid of this right now. It's like the longer you put off getting right with God, your body just, it can't hang. Because your heart, your, watch this, it's so crazy. Your spiritual side will eat your, 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 your vitality. Because your spirit, the soul of you, is who you really are. This is just a covering for your soul. And when that's not right, it affects who you are. Guilt is the anchor that keeps us living in the past and drowns out the joy God wants to create in our lives. So the beautiful part of this is that God wants our, lo- our lives to be light and joyful and have happiness, true happiness. But until we get our acts straight with God by repenting, God is waiting for us, but until we do that, we will just keep on grinding away with our own thing. God just goes, hey, whenever you're ready, here we go. But you're gonna spend years in frustration. Lastly, we are built for a pure heart, we are sabotaged by a guilty heart, and lastly, we are transformed by a clean heart. Once we acknowledge our sin to God and don't hide it or cover it, God can begin to clean our heart and transform us. So if you're in Psalm 32, turn a couple pages over or swipe a couple screens over to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Also a psalm by David. So Psalm 32 is by David. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, his rebellion against God. And he also wrote Psalm 51. Look at Psalm 51, verse 10. (laughs) 
Does anybody have the superscript before verse 1 in, in Psalm 51? Does anybody have it? It's a, it's a, it's a little bit of writing. It might be even in your, in, your, uh, in your app. There's a little bit of writing right before verse 1 in Psalm 51. Does everybody see that? Does everybody see what that is? Okay, a chunk of you have that? Let me read that because it's not even in verse 1. It's before verse 1. It's not even part of the, the, uh, the reading, but listen. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him, after he had gone into Bathsheba. You know what that means? That literally means he went into Bathsheba. That means he had sexual intercourse with someone else's wife. Bathsheba was the, was the wife of David, who was the king, his lieutenant in the army, his captain. His wife was Bathsheba. He sent his captain out to go do battle, and he had sex with his wife while he was gone. A man of God commits atrocious sin, watch this, and it gets worse. Bathsheba gets pregnant, whoops. David, king, goes, I better do something about this. And you know how he decides to deal with it? Instead of repenting of his sin, coming to to, uh, Bathsheba's husband and going, I totally screwed up, you know, blah, 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 blah. He did exactly what you and I would do if we were king. You know what he did? He had Bathsheba's husband killed on the battlefield. And he goes, ah, now things will be better. So now he's an adulterer. He's a murderer. So if you think somehow in your head, oh, these are Bible people. They don't know what it's like to live in the real world. No, that's pretty real. That's pretty real world. David, a man of God, screwed up massively. He refused to repent, and it ate him alive inside. And now Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 10. Underline it, circle it, make it a part of your life. Create in me, create in me. I can't make it clean, God, but create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew or regenerate a right spirit within me. Is that not beautiful? That means no matter how far off you are from God, you are never too far away from God. God is never too far away from you when you repent. Ever. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And it echoes back to Psalm 32, blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven. As God already knows what's in our life closet, By not dealing with our baggage, we only damage ourselves. So, I brought my own closet today. You like it? So, see, closet. Closet. In our society, we have something that says, I hope that doesn't come out of the closet. Or the skeletons in the closet. We actually have a, a cultural phrase. Because most cultures, pre-industrial, they never had closets because they didn't have anything to put in there. But we got so much stuff, we actually have closets. So, we have a phrase that says, gosh, I hope nothing comes out of the closet. And for many of us, when we look back on our lives, we go, gosh, I hope nobody finds out about that. I hope nobody finds out what's in my closet. I hope those skeletons don't come tumbling out. You know, like when rock stars think they get away with stuff or whatever, and all of a sudden somebody took a video of it, and they're like, oops, or like athletes or whatever, or pastors, and they're like, this, nobody will find out about this. Oh, I just happened to have a high-def video of that. (laughs) So when we look back on our lives, there are many things that we remember, like our trip to uh, New Orleans, or Las Vegas. Remember the things that you said, that'll just stay in Vegas, but it really didn't. (laughs) There are many things that we've done that may have been great. Uh, Remember that time when you joined the uh, office basketball tournament? You're like, I won the basketball tournament, man. I got a trophy. I got a trophy. It was me 
and five other guys, we took on the old ladies of the other department. <laughs> and I balled her up. And I shot a three in her face, even though she was 70 and she couldn't move, but I still balled her up. We won this trophy, man. Office champs. But then we start digging through the rest of our lives and, you know, we remember the time that we went on the hike and it wasn't Colorado and we smoked some pot up in the mountains. We fell down and injured ourselves and, and other weird stuff is like in your shoe and old fruit and you go, how did this get in there? Has anybody ever moved your house? It's the most hellish thing that's ever, that can happen. Because you realize, you're like, I don't have a lot of stuff. I, I, I wear the same jeans every day and a watch and I don't even have a lot of stuff. But then you've got to move and you forgot about the stuff you stuffed up in the garage, in your attic, and if you have a walk-in, Closet, you, all your good stuff's in the front. But as you start walking towards the back, it gets scarier and scarier. Like, what is all this stuff? I can, you know, it's like the but, your dad's butterfly collar shirt from 1978. He wore it at a Bee Gees concert. You're like, what is this? <laughs> you start looking through everything. Like, the deeper you get into your closet, you're like, things are scary back here. Like, not even light gets back to the, in the back of this closet. You don't realize until you move how much stuff you've got in your life. And it's the same thing. When you start taking a moral inventory of your heart and you start looking into your life closet, you forget about things that have been weighing you down for years. And there are some things that, you know, like, gosh, the relationship with my son or my daughter, I remember the good times we had when they were teenagers, but now they've moved away and we never really got along that good and now they don't call anymore and, you know, I don't know if I'll get to see my grandkids if that day ever happens and that kind of breaks my heart. The Rubik's Cube you tried to figure out from the 80s and that was totally useless. <laughs> and that time that you had that affair and she got pregnant, and you paid for her abortion, and someone had to die to cover your sin so that hopefully no one would find out. And so now, you just live with regret and guilt Because you did what you thought was right at the time, but you look back now and it hasn't created a pure heart anymore. It's created guilt and regret. And so what we hope is that nobody looks in our closet. We just hope nobody gets in here and sees these. But you know the funny thing about God is he already knows what's in your closet. <coughs> he knows everything. And you know what's awesome about God is he loves you anyway. Isn't that crazy? Because we go, if anybody finds out what I've done, they're gonna hate me. They're gonna hate what I've done because I'm, I'm horrible inside. But you know what's crazy is that God already knows those things and he loves you anyway. And so watch what God does. I close with this. God is so amazing that he says, I already know. Come to me and just repent and be open and I'll heal you because I already know what's in this closet. So confess it to me and be new and be changed.
And when we've gotten our vertical relationship with God right, we have to get our horizontal relationships right. Jesus offers a return to purity of heart when we take responsibility and don't rationalize, but recognize, repent, and are restored. Don't put it off on somebody else. Don't go, oh, it's because of this or A, B, C, D. Just go, there are things I did that hurt other people. I need to take responsibility for that. Have other people hurt me? Yep. And I can't do anything about them taking responsibility, but I gotta take responsibility for me. It's nobody else's fault. If you did it, you did it. So take responsibility for it. Be a man, be a woman, and take responsibility. Because it's not until you take responsibility that you can start to feel healed. It says, blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven. Meaning you take responsibility for that rebellion. Once the heart is made right before God, what the hands have done must be made right before men. We are called to take a personal moral inventory of our wrongs and make restitution as we can. There are some people that you fought with that are dead. The abortion you had, you fought with your dad your whole life and you hated him and now he's dead. And there you still hold guilt and regret and anger about those things. And I encourage this. I encourage you either on the back of these notes or make a mental note of it to write a letter. I've walked women through the heartache of of having an abortion and say, you give that baby a name. And you write a letter to, to John or whoever it was or Greg or Sally and you just write that letter and you go, I'm so sorry. I thought I was doing the right thing. I wasn't following the Lord at this time in my life and I just want to apologize. I just apologize to you and to God for what I did, the choices I made. Dad, we never got a chance to talk before you died and I hated you my whole life for the things that you did or didn't do or blah, blah, blah. You write that letter out. And you'll be amazed at how your own acknowledgement, and if it's up to you, repentance will lighten your heart because you admitted it before God, you admitted it before people the best you could. Once this vertical relationship gets right, you gotta make things horizontally relate, correct. Hey, I know our marriage didn't work out. I really wasn't living for the Lord, and I just, I wanna say for, for the part that was mine, I apologize. I apologize that I didn't help our marriage to work out. I got really bitter and angry at you and, and, uh, and I kind of sabotaged our relationship. And even if the other person goes, screw you, blah, 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 and turns into a fight fest, just go, hey, I'm just trying to be at peace as much as is up to me. Even if they don't accept it, you take responsibility for your part. You'll be amazed at how God <sighs> will lighten the load. When you say, I, I, I acknowledge what's in this closet, I don't hide it from God because you can't hide it. I get clean, and now I can live a blessed life for God because he has made me new.